Hi there, this is Dr. John Bergs. We're from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And I just want to make a couple of short videos on Jesus' genealogy in time for Christmas. Because as we get to the last days of Advent and to Christmas itself, our Lord's genealogy comes into increasing focus, especially because it's probably the gospel reading that most folks are going to hear at Mass during the Christmas celebration. And that's because the most popular Mass for folks to go to is the Vigil Mass of the Nativity, or the Vigil Mass of Christmas, which is usually celebrated between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. on Christmas Eve night. Of course, everybody wants to go to church and kind of get that out of the way so they can go back home and open presents, not endorsing that viewpoint, but fact of the matter is, there's many of us with young children around, and pressures being what they are, there is kind of this uh, compulsion, uh, you know, to get to church and then start the holiday. And so that Vigil Mass is very popular, and the gospel for the Vigil Mass is actually the genealogy and the birth of our Lord, taken from Matthew's gospel, from Matthew chapter 1. Now, If a modern novelist tried to start his uh, potential New York Times bestseller with a genealogy, his editor from Simon & Schuster or Penguin Random House would probably immediately send the manuscript back and say, think of a different way to start your book. But for Matthew, a genealogy was actually a gripping and a fascinating way for him to write to a Jewish audience. And the reason is that the people of Judah had been waiting for 600 years for somebody with the right genealogy to be king. You see, the traditional dynasty that was supposed to rule over the people of Judah was the dynasty of David. David established an empire over Israel back in about 1000 BC, and his Descendants reigned for over 400 years, but then were conquered by the Babylonians in 587 B.C., taken into exile for about 50 to 70 years, were allowed to come back, but a son of David was never put back on the throne. And over time, the public lost track of even where the royal house was. When Matthew is uh, writing to the people of Judah... There is an imposter dynasty actually on the throne. There is a non-Davidide, in fact, not even an Israelite, who's on the throne, and his name is Herod. Actually, a string of Herods going back to the founder of the Herodian dynasty, who was Herod the Great, the famous evil king who was ruling when Jesus was born. What is Herod doing? Why is he ruling when there is supposed to be a son of David on the throne of the people of Judah? Well, the backstory is that Herod was an Edomite, that is to say, a descendant of Esau, that red hairy brother of Jacob, whose other name was Israel, who gave rise to the nation of Israel. So Herod wasn't even a Jew, he wasn't even an Israelite, but he married into the Uh, the dynasty of the Maccabees who had been ruling over Israel before him. And then that gave him some claim to the throne. And then Herod sailed to Rome and got himself appointed king of Israel by the Roman Senate and sailed back to the land of Israel with a bunch of Roman legions and got himself established by military force. So when we open the Gospel of Matthew, we've got this imposter on the throne He's not a Jew. He's not an Israelite. He's on the throne due to Roman power. And the people of Israel, though, really want a true king. But they don't know where that true king is. They don't know where the person is who's got the true genealogy. And that's why Matthew's gospel is so interesting if you're an ancient Jew, because he begins with what you've been waiting for, what you've been looking for for 600 years the genealogy of the true, authentic king, the son of David. And thus it begins. So let's, uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 1. And for the rest of this short little video, I just want to look at the very first verse. It says, An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, or Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
Wow. There's so much theology packed into just that first verse. In that one verse, Matthew ties Jesus to three of the most important figures in the Old Testament and in all of salvation history. Three of the great covenant mediators of the story of salvation and three individuals who are associated with promises with prophetic oracles about a coming blessed seed or descendant. And these three figures are, of course, Adam, Abraham, and David. Now, the connection to David and Abraham is very obvious, right? Because it says Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's talk about those obvious points for just a minute. The son of David, he's called. This is being used as a title. Little known fact, there were lots of sons of David running around in the first century, but only one had the direct line of inheritance to the throne. That is Jesus. Moreover, about this heir to the throne, there was a famous prophecy. Back in 2 Samuel 7, it speaks of the seed of David. And of the seed of David, it's promised that he's going to rule over the nations forever. This seed of David is one of the three great seeds of the Old Testament salvation history who are given these divine promises. So right away, we find out that Jesus is the son of David. He's the heir. He's the one of whom it was said in 2 Samuel 7 that he's going to rule over the nations forever. Then Jesus is called the son of Abraham. So we're backing up in salvation history. Not just a son of Abraham because every Jew was a son of Abraham, but the son of Abraham. By this, it means the particular heir. Again, the particular seed. Because about the seed of Abraham, it was said in Genesis 22, 18, after Isaac, Abraham's original seed, was almost sacrificed on Mount Moriah. You remember that story, how a ram was in the thicket, the angel called from heaven, and Isaac got off the altar, and they sacrificed the uh, ram instead. But after Abraham had shown that his love for God was so great that he was willing to part with his only begotten son, much like God would later part with his only begotten son for the sake of humanity. Again, after Abraham had shown his love, God promised him in Genesis 22:18 and said, through your seed, I'm reading literally from the Hebrew here, through your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So that is who Jesus is. He is the seed or the descendant who is going to bless all the nations. So we've got that connection with David and with Abraham, the seed of David and the seed of Abraham. What about that connection to Adam that I mentioned? Well, this is a little more subtle, but the verse begins, the account of the genealogy of Jesus and Messiah. More literally, it's the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And that phrase, the book of the genealogy of, occurs in only one other place in all of the Bible. And that's in Genesis 5 verse 1, where the full phrase is the book of the genealogy of Adam. Any good Jewish reader is going to know that. When they pick up Matthew and they read the book of the genealogy of they're waiting for Adam to drop, and instead, Jesus Christ drops. What's the message? Very clear. Jesus Christ is a new Adam, a second Adam, one who is going to bring us back to the Garden of Eden, uh, one who's going to restore to us access to the river of life and the tree of life by which we can live forever. But even more importantly, this associates Jesus with the promise of a son to Adam's wife, Eve. That promise is given in Genesis 3.15, where it speaks of the seed of the woman, specifically the seed of Eve there, but the seed of the woman. And it's said of the seed of the woman that he will crush the serpent's head. And the serpent, of course, is the embodiment of Satan in the larger context. So that picks up the, the third seed of the Old Testament, the, the seed that we have not discussed yet, We've talked about the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, but then there's the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. Jesus is all three seeds. And not coincidentally, when we get to the end of this genealogy, we're going to find out that Jesus is not biologically descended 
from any of the men listed in this genealogy. He's only descended from the woman that comes at the end of the genealogy, Mary, because Jesus is that woman's seed, and he's going to crush the head of Satan. When we continue reading in Matthew's genealogy, it gets not less but more interesting because in the space of the next six verses or so, there's mentioned not one but four different women. Now, women were very rarely mentioned in ancient genealogies, although occasionally it was done if your female ancestor was uh, a queen or some other famous personage. Uh, the usual suspects that we might expect would get mentioned in our Lord's genealogy would be the great matriarchs, right? Like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, maybe Leah. But the women mentioned are not the usual suspects. Watch and let's see what I mean. Beginning in chapter 2. Abraham became the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. All right. All pretty ordinary up to here. But then, Judah became the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Who's Tamar? Well, go back to Genesis 37, you get a really interesting backstory. Tamar was the Canaanitess daughter-in-law of Judah, who was married to Judah's oldest and then second oldest son, Judah's oldest and second oldest sons were so wicked that God put them to death, but Judah didn't know that. He thought Tamar was slipping something in their meatloaf on Thursday nights, and so Judah was reticent to marry Tamar off to his third and only remaining son, which was the custom of the day, and so he left her unmarried. Well, Tamar took things into her own hands and uh, dressed up looking good and seduced her father-in-law, Judah, and by him conceived twin sons, these, uh, these boys Perez and Zerah. These twin sons uh, <laughs> conceived in an act of seduction when uh, Tamar was pretending to be uh, practicing the world's oldest profession, by the side of the road, again, these two sons, Perez and Zerah, account for about 90% of the descendants of Judah, who are the Jews. This is a painful reminder in Matthew's genealogy that almost all Jews are half Canaanite through their ancestress, Tamar, and then not even through a legitimate marriage, through uh, one encounter that was not followed up by marriage, and Tamar remained unmarried but living in her father-in-law Judah's home for the rest of her life as the, the mother of his majority of his heirs. So that is very interesting. Well, let's go on and see what other kind of women we get mentioned here. Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab became the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Oh, Rahab? Who was Rahab? Was she, she some great Israelite queen or something? By no means. She also was a Canaanite. She was, in fact, a Jerichoite an inhabitant of Jericho, and she was, to put it politely, a madam who ran an establishment in Jericho where the spies, remember the spies, the Israelite spies who went in to spy out Jericho before the armies attacked? The spies took refuge in her establishment and hid out there for a while, and then she swung a deal with the spies that she would hide them and uh, get them off to safety provided that the Israelite army would spare her and her family. And that's exactly what happened. The Israelite army came in, attacked Jericho, and uh, uh, Rahab hung a red cord in her window. That was a sign of blood. It was similar to the blood marking above the door during the Passover. And that was a sign that the Israelite soldiers should pass over her house. And so Rahab and her family 
kind of went through a, a recapitulation of the Passover when the Israelite soldiers, as the, so to speak, angels of death, came in and uh, wiped out Jericho. And thereafter, Rahab, we find out, married into the line of Judah, despite her extremely sketchy uh, Jerichoite, Canaanite background. Well, okay, interesting. Let's go on. And then her descendant, Boaz, became the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Well, who is Ruth? Is she some Israelite queen or great matriarch? By no means. She is a Moabitess, and the Moabites were ancestral enemies of the people of Israel. But, you know, there's this backstory from the book of Ruth. She married an Israelite man who died, and then she followed her mother-in-law back to the hometown, which was Bethlehem. And then she uh, got, to, uh, got to know and kind of started to fall in love with Boaz, this wealthy Israelite farmer that we find out about in the book of Ruth. His name means in him is strength, and he's kind of a type of Christ. But Boaz starts falling in love with her. She starts falling in love with him. There is a sketchy scene in Ruth chapter 3 where Ruth makes a very forward play for Boaz at night where she uh, puts on her little black dress, so to speak, and her best perfume and snuggles up next to uh, Boaz uh, while he's uh, a little bit intoxicated after a big party uh, at the threshing floor during like a big harvest party. There in Ruth 3, I tell my students, it's the sketchy scene that gets the PG-13 rating for this rom-com, which is otherwise fairly tame. Uh, but anyway, she makes a play for Boaz, but nothing happens there that evening. Boaz is too good of a guy. He, uh, he uh, appreciates R Ruth uh, making an offer of herself to him, but says, no, we're going to do this all the right way. And so he sends her home, and in the morning, he goes through all the proper procedures to marry her in a good Israelite fashion, and she becomes his wife, and they have a beautiful marriage, and they end up having children who are in the line of the ruling dynasty. So that's uh, Ruth, um, who is, again, a Moabitess, and then let's continue reading on. Obed became the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of David the king. And then we get the fourth and final woman here. David became the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Ooh, hurt me. Awkward. She doesn't even get named. Her name is Bathsheba. But Matthew just mentions her as she who had been the wife of Uriah, painfully calling into focus the most embarrassing episode in the history of the royal dynasty when David himself committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband Uriah. And then Bathsheba, though, became the mother of Solomon, who was the heir. Well, boy, that is a bunch of awkward, um, counterintuitive women to mention. Most of them are Gentiles or, or at least have Gentile connections. For example, Bathsheba was married to a Gentile previously. Most of them have sketchy, romantic backgrounds, to say the least. Why include women like this in the genealogy of our Lord? Well, St. Matthew is preparing us to receive a Messiah who later in his career is going to be criticized and accused for hanging around with Gentiles and prostitutes. And St. Matthew is saying, look, if you're going to criticize Jesus because he hung around with tax collectors, who, you know, who were in close association with the Gentiles and with prostitutes, just acknowledge the fact that the royal dynasty of David, from whom everybody expected a Messiah and a great savior figure to come, was itself, so to speak, contaminated with the blood of Gentiles and prostitutes. 
the God who reaches out to all people and the God who reaches out even to people from sinful and unsavory backgrounds has been doing his work all the way through the Old Testament and now is culminating that by sending a Savior who's going to go out to reach people from all nationalities and people from all backgrounds, even the most unsavory.